Chapter 37 Because of the failing daylight, Sergeant Wanwell suggested they take the water voles indoors for questioning. In Great Hall, there was much curiosity about the object strapped to Euphus's back. Abbot Humble ventured to touch the hard shell. What is this thing, Mr. Lightball? Digity unfastened the strapping and placed her pet upon the floor. Why, that's me darling little rock bottom. A gasp of surprise went up as the creature poked out its head and legs. He began crawling towards a group of dibbons. Squeaking and squealing, they leapt back. Four mole Bruffy scratched his snout, expressing wonder at the sight. But I've never seen out like you in my life, no sir. Sister Armel knelt down by rock bottom. He craned his head forward so she could scratch gently under his chin. The sister obliged, smiling. Friends, meet the walking stone. Recognition dawned in Humble's eyes. Of course, the walking stone. What a funny little fellow he is. Where did you find him, ma'am? Euphus swelled his chest out proudly. Shall twas myself that found the fella. Sister Armel interrupted Euphus. Wait, don't tell me. You found this creature not far from the lake. It came out of a hole at the foot of an old sycamore, all thick and overgrown with ivy leaves. Am I right, Mr. Lightpaw? For the first time he could remember, Euphus was lost for words. He could only stammer, What? Who? Who? Sister Screef took from her sleeves a copy of the poem which she habitually carried around with her and began reading. Where the sun falls from the sky and dances at a pebble's trot. Where little leaves slay big leaves, where it would meets earth I stop. Safe from the savage son of drums, here the secret lies alone, the symbol of all power, the mighty walking stone. Euphus stared at the sister and the recorder. How do you all know that? For the sake of manners, Tam had not cut in on Armin and Screve, but he could hold his impatience no longer. Mrs. Lightpole, ma'am, I'm sure you can explain about your pet to every beast, but right now I must speak to your husband on a matter of great importance. He nodded towards Cavern Hall. Down there, Euphus. Now, Skipper, Captain Fortendom, Sergeant Wanwell, I need you too. The vol thief was slightly put out by the fact he'd not eaten in a while, and he wasted no time in telling them so. And it is a sad thing to be offered none of the famous Redwall hospitality sort is. Recent decent victuals haven't passed me starving mauled lips since I don't know when. Captain Fortendom eyed him sternly. Talk first, eat later. Laddie Buck, what? You tell McBurl exactly what he jolly well wants to know and then we'll feed you. Euphus stared around at the tough faces and shrugged. Ah, well, here's what happened. We all leave in the woodlands after many a hard old did's match. Myself, the missus and Doogie. I was carrying rock bottom and rolling that drum along. Twas me that stole it from under the vermin's noses, you know. Then suddenly, without a by your leave, just we made it out into the open, out judges a gang of vermin. Skipper halted him with a gesture. A gang, you say? I mean, it's a gang. Lying like thieving was second nature to Euphus. He squinted one eye and scratched his chin as if in estimating. Oh, I'd say at least there was a skull I could see, and the old gulo beast too. Sure, that's one fierce-looking creature. Have you not seen the claws and fangs on him? Tam cut in. Never mind how gulo looked. Exactly how many fighting beasts were with him. Think. Euphus pursed his lips. Well, as I said, I was about to score. Sure, but I could hear lots of others hiding amid the trees I must have been. I can't give you a number for certain. They was armed to the very teeth, though. Tam was pawing at his sword hilt. And Doogie. What about Doogie? The vol thief nodded. Well, you give me a chance. I'm just getting to that. Anyhow, like I said, I outcharged the vermin, and I dealt with the nearest three right away. But I have me darling wife to think of, so I says to Doogie, there's far too many other villains. We'll have to cut and run for it. I'll see you back at the Abbey. I'm sorry about the drum. I had to leave it, but lives are more valuable than some old drum now, aren't they? One will peered closely at the vol thief. So you and your good lady wife ran for the Abbey, sir? All well and good, but what became of Mr. Plum, sir? Euphus grinned disarmingly. Oh, I wouldn't be fretting about Doogie, friend. Well, there's a beast that can look after herself. You can rely on that. Tam's jaw tightened. We know that, but what became of him? The vol thief shrugged. Sure, he went one way and my wife and I went the other. That's the last I saw of him. Ach, I wouldn't be surprised if he's not out there now, knocking at the gate to come in. I wouldn't worry about him. Tam began making for the door. I don't like it. Doogie could be in real trouble out there. Skipper reached the door ahead of Tam and blocked it. Now hold on, mate. Let's think a little bit before we sail off with our swords drawn. It's dark out there now. We don't know their numbers. 
the border of challenge skipper. Dookie Plum must be my friend through thick and thin. I've got to go out there and help him. Captain Fortenden placed himself alongside the other chieftain. Listen to Ray's mouth, chap. Maybe a trap. Tam shook his head. A trap? In what we? The hair captain explained. Gulo might be doing this to draw us out and leave Redwall undefended. Who knows? Perhaps Mr Plum is hiding safe somewhere, just waiting for a chance to make a dash for the blinking abbey. The sergeant backed up Fortendum's statement. Captain's right, sir. Best thing we can do is mount a full garden of walls and wait, at least until daylight. <laughs> Tam paced up and down, his paw gripping the hilt of Martin's sword. Then he gave in to the wisdom of his friends. Until daybreak, then. But only till then. I feel terrible leaving Doogie alone out there. I'll be watching from the south wall top if you need me. Euphus patted his shoulder. Ah, don't go fretting yourself now. Doogie'll be fine. He'll sleep. The border warrior eyed him coldly. If anything has happened to my mate, and you'll be telling a pack of lies, you'll answer to me for it. The hairs of the long patrol, together with all the able-bodied red wallers, turned out on the wall tops to watch for any sign of Doogie. Even Turgon forgot his depression and came down from the attics to stand on the ramparts. Inside the abbey, none of the Dibbons would go up to bed. They all wanted to stay up and play with their new-found friend, the Walking Stone. To keep the peace, Digity agreed to sleep in the dormitory with Rockbottom. All the Dibbons trooped upstairs, following close behind the two. Digity allowed Mimsy and Perkle to carry the little tortoise between them. First, however, the Volwife laid out specific instructions. Go careful now, and don't drop him, and don't feed him any more of those candy chestnuts. He'll get quite the tummy ache. The questions and inquiries came thick and fast at her. She answered each one in turn. Do, do you want to him to have bath, Mrs? Ah, no, you drown him by putting him in a bath. <laughs> I wish I was a rock bottom. Does he come out with that shell and every night, eh? Indeed he doesn't, and don't you try and take him out. Abbot Humble chuckled as he watched them disappearing round the bend in the stairway. He turned to old brother Gordale, the gatekeeper, and sister Armel. Poor Mrs. Lightball. Imagine having to spend the night with our dibbons. What do you say we take some supper up to our friends on the walls? Burlop was in the kitchens. He wanted nothing more to do with vermin since the day he had slain one in battle. With his help, and that of some kitchen volunteers, they set about making some hot fowls stuffed with different fillings, some savoury, others sweet. Burlop brought up some cordials from his cellars and heated them. They should keep the life in them. Sometimes the nights can grow chilly upon those ramparts with naught to do but stand about. Tam was leaning against the corner of the southwest battlement when Arnold approached him with food. He had been peering out into the night and did not hear her come. Startled, the border warrior turned suddenly. The infirmary sister apologised. I'm sorry, Tam. I didn't mean to surprise you. Would you like some supper? He released his grip on the sword hilt. I didn't hear you coming because I was concentrating in the other direction, out there. Armel placed the food on the battlement ledge. Still no sign of Mr Plum. Tam shook his head. Not yet. I've got a feeling in my bones that he's not too far away. I'll wait and see. Armel indicated the supper. Then you can eat while you wait. Tam's eyes never left the woodland fringe. I don't feel like eating until I know Doogie's all right. The pretty young squirrel placed the tray firmly under Tam's nose. You must eat something, Mr McBurl. A stubborn look crossed the borderer's face. I've already said that I don't feel like eating until I know my friend is safe for Sister Armel. She spread her paws expressively. You'll have to eat sooner or later, Mr. McBurl. Come on now, I've made this supper especially for you. Tam knew he was going to lose the argument, so he relented. Tell you what, let's share it. I'll eat half if you will. She smiled. There's not much difference between Dibbons and Warriors. Sometimes you've both got to be coaxed into doing what's best for you. Right, we'll share supper. Tam bit into one of the fowls. Mmm, tea's an onion. Why didn't you tell me? That's one of my favourites. Armel took a sip of hot cordial and winked mischievously at him. I could have tempted you into eating, but I like being bossy. <laughs> now eat up, Mr McBurl. Tam laughed as he saluted and took a huge bite of the fowl. All right, you are, ma'am. Your wish is my command. Together they passed the night hours, eating, drinking and talking. All along the walls, hares and red wallers were doing the same thing in a common bond of friendship as they kept watch on the darkened plain and woodlands. Dawn's first mystic light stole out of the east, pale shades of misty pastels illuminating the sky as the first birdsong trilled softly over the stillness of mossflower. Then the big drum boomed out. <laughs>
its echoes reverberating around the abbey and ramparts of Redwall. Turgon, who had posted himself on the threshold over the main gate at the western wall, shrilled out a harsh message, arousing every creature to action. Yeah! The bird sees vermin yonder! Yeah! Tam's sword flashed forth in the dawn light. He thundered along the walkway to the threshold, with Armel dashing behind him. Skipper and Sergeant Onewheel bellowed out orders to the creatures on the wall tops. Hold your positions there! Don't leave your posts! Long patrol hodgers! Up front with Captain Fortendom. The rest of you, stay put. Stay in the ranks, sir. Rackety Tam McBurl skidded to a halt alongside the goshawk. Where's the vermin, Turgon? Where? Boom, 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 boom. Over the deep drum tones, Turgon pointed with his beak. Yarra, yarra! See! Over! There! The breath froze in Tam's throat as he looked and saw.